Hey, Paul Hummeler from Dream Guitars, and today we're visiting my buddy Larry Brown, aka Lawrence K. Brown, depending on different eras of his career. He's done all, built all kinds of instruments from guitars to many, many lutes and um, violins and cellos and violas, and um, he's, he's the man. Um, <laughs> I'm really excited to be here, A, because Larry's a great guy. We're getting to be good, good buddies now that he lives here, and um, he also has just a lot to share with us about about building. Um, you'll see in this video we're looking at a few instruments that he's currently building for Dream Guitars. Um, one of these just completed. Um, he specializes a lot in vintage inspired instruments like the Martins and Gibsons of old, um, but he adds things like his own one bolt adjustable neck system, um, which you know makes a player's dream come true of always having perfect action. And, uh, and they're just really fun to play. We've got a number of them at the shop right now and Every one of them, when I play them, I just have a blast. You know, they just make me smile, and that's that's the key, right? That's what we're all looking for. So, um, Larry, let me start with, do you remember the first guitar you ever held? Oh, my goodness. The first guitar I ever held, it was a harmony, and it was white, and it made my fingers bleed. And <laughs> I was... Uh, I paid for it with my paper route money when I was 12 years old, and I took it home and I tried to play Simon and Garfunkel and those things on it, and uh, so that was jumping into the deep end, but quickly I got rid of that and just found out what a better guitar was like. Cool. What was the better one? Oh, well, oh, then, I went the to a, <laughs> then I went to a classical guitar, and then, uh, and then I, I found out about old Martins and everything, and... Uh, uh, and I bought a Martin 12 string, and I still have it. It's hanging up in the corner over there. Um, um, and then I started collecting uh, Martin and Gibson early instruments, um, uh, you know, especially when I went to college and stuff like that. Um, but then uh, when I was in college, uh, I got into the folk scene, and that sort of uh, took me back uh, to the Renaissance lute. Um, I have a master's degree in medieval English literature. Okay. Um, and so that tied in with uh, the music of the 15th and 16th centuries there. And so I decided that I wanted to loot. I wanted to go backwards. And, but this, at this time, uh, you know, in the early 1970s, it was impossible. I mean, you couldn't get one. Um, so uh, I joined the Loot Society of America. There's actually one like that. And eventually wound up on the board of directors. Um, um, but I researched and built and sold uh, uh, about 1,300 lutes, which right. is more than anybody since the end of the Renaissance. Yeah, um, that's pretty remarkable. I mean, <laughs> I mean, let me repeat that. <laughs> 1,300 instruments is, is remarkable, and then lutes, you know, we'll talk a little bit about how lute, building a lute compares to guitar, but I would imagine, I know, I've seen some of the photos of your lutes, and there's some intricate work on some of them as well. So um. Lutes are extremely lightly built, uh, much more so than the lightest flamenco guitar you've ever had experience with. Mm -hmm. um, and they are very lightly strung with the uh, natural gut strings and everything. But after doing that for so long, that got into my head, you know, the importance of lightness in building. Mm -hmm. uh, many, I would say most factory instruments nowadays are overbuilt. And they do this uh, for safety reasons, for warranty reasons. Uh, they, they build them at least 10% too heavy in order that, you know, these instruments don't bounce on them because they don't know how they're going to be treated. Uh, yeah. You know, they're going to be abused. Um, but if you want a really responsive, you know, acoustically great instrument, you have to build right to that edge of lightness. The, the, the best sound comes almost at the edge of structural collapse. <laughs> but, you know, with, with lots of experience, you know where that point is and you don't cross that line. Yeah. But uh, I, I said to Larry just a moment ago, <laughs> when I personally have an instrument built for myself, I tell the builder, I give you permission to build it on the verge of imploding because <laughs> I want that edge because I, I, I agree. I've played a lot of great guitars over the years and some that actually had structural problems, you're like constantly creeping up over the years, but they just sound amazing because right. they're right on that uh, on that, that scary edge. But uh, right. So when did you start building? What year did you build your first instrument, and was that a guitar? Uh, it actually was a guitar. It was just a standard dreadnought guitar. I started in 1973. Okay. And I went uh, full time pro in 1977, and that's actually. All that I've done my whole life is, is build instruments. I'm up to about 2,200 now. Um, That's remarkable. Yeah, and I, at one time I had 13 violins and violas and cellos in the Asheville Symphony. Yeah. Um, 
but um, I returned to my old love, which was the steel string guitar. And so, you know, for the past 10 years or so, I've been concentrating exclusively on steel string guitars. Very cool. And Larry's a great musician. I've been at jam sessions with Larry, and he plays guitar and fiddle and sings. And what else do you play? <laughs> well, I play the banjo and, uh -huh. and, and the lute, of course. Uh -huh. um, um, and uh, my partner, uh, Karen Bartlett, and I uh, sing together. And uh, uh, we like uh, old-time country songs from the 1920s and 30s and, and up through the 50s. We do Leuven Brothers stuff and Delmore great. Brothers stuff. and. Great and, uh, you know, brothers' harmonies and things like that. That's great harmonies, yeah. Um, aside from your own, what, what's, and it doesn't have to be a guitar, but what was the most amazing instrument you've ever played and, and why? Aside from your own. <laughs> the most amazing instrument I ever played was at the end of the 1960s. Um, um, I had access to the Folger Shakespeare Library in in Washington DC because of my academic work and they actually had uh, an original lute there by a maker named Michael Harton that was built in 1598 and was in almost perfect condition and nowadays with a museum protocol they wouldn't allow you to touch it you know they would have a docent there you know to show you the instrument and everything but they actually let me go in there and tune up this lute from 1598 and play it Wow. Uh, that was probably the most amazing instrument. And, and it was so lightweight, if you shut your eyes, you didn't know you had it. <laughs> <laughs> That's light. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's very cool. And, and, you know, we think about, like, whenever I get in a vintage guitar that's maybe 100 years old, I'm like, wow, if this thing could talk. But imagine the stories of 15, a lute right. from the 1500s would have, right? I, yeah. I, I have uh, friends... Um, that work in museums, and so um, a lot of times you get to see the the most interesting instruments are not on display, and you go and, and you talk to them, and they'll take you into the back rooms and everything. And yep. at the Smithsonian, I've seen complete cabinets with their own temperature and humidity control systems that are full of Stradivari violins and Guarnerius violins. And if anything happens to the electricity, they don't care. They have a self-powered system. Wow, that's incredible. Each one's worth millions. Oh yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> many probably. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. You've been building guitars since, since 73. Yep. Um, how many guitars would you say you've made? Oh, including Renaissance guitars, um, three or four hundred. Right. Yeah. Still right. quite a great number. Right. Yeah. The Renaissance guitar was the ancestor of the ukulele, and we're currently uh, enjoying a ukulele boom in this country. But uh, the ukulele came from the four-course Renaissance guitar that was dropped off in Hawaii in the 1550s uh, by Portuguese sailors. And so they adopted it. Um, the Renaissance guitar looks just like a ukulele, except that it has a little carved rosette in the center. Mm -hmm. So I made uh, many of those for the early music community. Um, and I also made Baroque guitars, uh, which are, are five courses of doubled strings, mm -hmm. and also very lightweight, uh, ladder barred, very similar tonally to the lute, um, mm -hmm. but I built a run of 27 of those, and that was featured on the cover of uh, American Lute 3. Very cool. Um, who are some players that you've um, built instruments <clears throat> for, whether they're well known or not, that, that you are very, you're just happy that that music's being made on your instrument? Oh, well, um, we live in the Asheville, North Carolina uh, area, which is a hotbed of uh, old time and bluegrass music. And um, so uh, mostly I have not catered to name players that, that, you know, that you would recognize nationally. But, um, um, you know, there are very many of my guitars locally in, in the Asheville old time and bluegrass scenes. Um, so... Um, if you would go to a fiddle festival, say at, at Mars Hill or, or Mount Airy or Galax or anything, you'd see you know maybe a dozen of my guitars there. That's cool. It really is a special community here. The mountain music is still here. People are still passionate about it. There's lots of people preserving the the heritage of it. You know. The third and fourth generations, you know, since it was originally recorded in the 20s. Yep. Yeah. Um, just... Yeah, and that. Uh, that tradition is alive and kicking here, you know, yeah. uh, not only just uh, 
you know, picked up in, in the community jams and things like that, but uh, many of the colleges in the Asheville and, and Tennessee area concentrate on these programs. Uh, yep. uh, Warren Wilson College in uh, uh, East Tennessee mm -hmm. um, and Mars Hill. Um, yes, we're so, talking about Shelly K. Adams. Yes. Mars Hill is having a, their week-long camp coming up in June, I think. So. Right, and yeah. the Swannanoa Gathering, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we all know about Hopefully you know about that if you're on Dream Guitars because we go there every year and uh, we usually report back of the fun there with uh, Tony McManus and Steve James and all these great teachers um, playing guitar for a week. It's adult uh, yeah. fantasy camp. So. Right. right. And Ray Chesna, he's got one of, of course. my guitars. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, right. great. Mm -hmm. yeah, Ray's a great player and repairman um, here in the area. Mm -hmm. um, that's what's cool about here, too. A lot of people are moving here who are in our world. You know, the, a lot of I talk to a lot of builders and musicians. Um, Todd Hallowell just moved here. He's a great fingerstyle player. In fact, he's looking for a dread, so I told him to come oh, play yours. Okay. Um, he's a great player. Um, you know, of course, Al Pedaway is already here, and David Wilcox. I just spent the weekend with him, so it's really vibrant. Scene. Al keeps threatening to come over here. Every time I put up a picture, you know, on Instagram or Facebook, it's I gotta get over there. He would love one of these. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring him by. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can leave that in there, Al. You're forewarned. <laughs>